College and is program head of photography studies. He received his MFA from a exhibits his work regionally. And next, beaming in from Bismarck, North Dakota, is the star of the public radio program, the Thomas Jefferson Hour. He's director of the Dakota Institute, chief consultant to the Theodore Roosevelt Center, professor at large at the University of Vermont. He spent his salad years at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar and was a recipient of the 1989 Humanities, National Humanities Medal. He's my very good friend, Clay Jenkinson. Hi guys, welcome. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Well, the last public presentation I made before the pandemic disrupted the world was at the TCC Roper Theater. And ah. so I miss all of you and I'm eager to get back to Virginia. I'm, I'm in Bismarck, North Dakota tonight. I should just say, given this topic, that I am speaking from lands sovereign to the Mandan nation. Mm -hmm. um, and the Mandan still very much exist about 65 miles north of Bismarck. Thank you for mentioning that. And uh, we miss you too at the Roper, uh, Clay. The Never seems like a full year unless we have one of your performances, but at least we're getting you uh, uh, at least your head and shoulders here tonight uh, and hopefully reaching a crowd that uh, can't just come to the Roper, but is scattered around the country. So, and that, tell us about Edward Curtis. Well, first, Tom, it's, it's really an honor to work with you, and I hope that those who are watching from the Chesapeake area or around the country mm -hmm. will send in their questions or challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, the more conversation we can have, Absolutely the better. But you know, if, if, with your permission, um, I'll just begin a little yeah. bit with this mm -hmm. presentation because I want to get um, just a sense of Curtis for those who may not know him very well. So, Paul, you said he took 40,000 images, which he did. But keep in mind, these were dry glass plate images. So today, when we take a photograph, say, with our smartphone, uh, it's a. It's not just a difference in degree. It's, it's essentially a difference in kind between that sort of photography. And and he was a pioneer. But before dry glass plate photography came wet glass plate photography, which was even more complicated and cumbersome and and fragile. So imagine carrying around these very heavy pieces of glass uh, deep into the outback of America. You know, in one instance, he took the train from Seattle to Winslow, Arizona. And then he had a wagon that went 60 miles over non-existent roads, shaking and, and rattling all of his gear. Uh, and he winds up in the middle of the middle of nowhere and sets up a tent uh, to serve both as a studio and as a darkroom. And then winds up in the course of a 30-some year career taking more than 40,000 uh, individual images. And the result of this uh, was a 20-volume publication project, one of the most ambitious publication projects in American history called the North American Indian. Um, and they were printed on such extraordinary paper um, at such great cost that the, the purchase price, even in his lifetime, was about $3,500 per set, which would be fifty dollars or $60,000 or more today. So this was never a commercial success. But what Curtis managed to do, and there he is on the right, was to undertake the most ambitious and comprehensive photographic uh, adventure with respect to Native Americans in American history. And one New York newspaper, in reviewing one of the early volumes, said this is the largest intellectual undertaking since the King James translation of the Bible uh, in the English Renaissance. So we're talking about something really major. And Tom, just, just to start, that's Curtis on, on the right looking rafish. Mm -hmm. But on the left, this is a photograph he took mm -hmm. in 1905 at Sagamore Hill. He was invited by the Roosevelts to come photograph their children. They had never met him up till that time. There's a long backstory to that. But while he was there, he said to TR out on the porch one day, mind if I take your portrait, uh, Mr. President? And Roosevelt agreed. And this is the result. And Jacob Reese who was a photographer himself, as I'm sure you know, uh, said, it's not a portrait, it's not a photograph, it is the man himself. And this became the most um, celebrated of all the presidential portraits of Theodore Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. 
So let me just give, here's the camera, by the way, or one of them. He had many, many cameras, of course, but here you have it. Uh, this is um, not for the faint of heart. Um, the glass plate goes in the back over here, and it's a very slow, painstaking and cumbersome and fragile process. There are the books. So I want to just show you 10 or 11 of the most iconic. I've selected these more or less at random, but of the most iconic photographs that he took. This is Red Cloud. Uh, the Ogallala leader from what's now South Dakota. And he got Red Cloud in his 90th year, just a couple of years before that great man's death. And uh, you can just see how stunning this is as a photograph. Red Cloud said, the white men have come and made many promises and they've only kept one. They promised to take our land and they did it. Here's Chief Joseph, another one of his most famous photographs, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce. He, uh, Curtis, took this photograph in his studio in Seattle and said that he thought that Chief Joseph was maybe the greatest Native American. This is my favorite Curtis photograph. This is called Eagle Catcher, uh, photographed in what's now North Dakota. Um, and this is in the Kildare Mountains, and that's an actual eagle. Um, and it gives you a sense of the access that Native people gave. The eagle catching ceremony is a sacred ceremony amongst the Mandan and the Hidatsa, uh, but they allowed um, Curtis to go and, and compose this photograph. Uh, here's um, one called Walpi Man from the Southwest. Uh, this is another great photograph of three young Hopi girls watching the snake dance from high above. And those sort of Mickey Mouse ears, that's their hair. Um, it's a, a special hairdressing that marriageable girls wore to announce their marriageability and their purity. This on the left is, is a, a picture he took down in the Southwest. And, and Tom, you can see, I mean, the haunting yeah. quality. I've just chosen that famous photograph from the National mm -hmm. Geographic of the Afghan girl, who was later found, as you know, and mm -hmm. just had a tough, tough life. But but I'll just stop there for you to make a preliminary comment. Look at the, so if you gave me $10 million or, or $100 million in the best cameras in the world and said, go out into Native American country and come back with portraits, I could do it, of course. You could do it. I could do it. Anyone could do it. But whether we could negotiate the way he did with the spirit and the soul and the personality of these, of these individuals so that they, in a sense, they gifted him access to their image in a way that would not have been inevitable. Am I making sense? Yeah. And, and you know, I, um, I tell you, I, I think that regardless of, uh, you know, the, the criticism one way or another that, that he, he might get from, from this body of work, which, you know, came about a little bit later, um, you know, he, he paid these people, you know, a, a lot of attention, you know, and, and he was, uh, you know, like, like you said, really passionate and dedicated in this pursuit. I mean, it was, uh, you know, he had a life of, uh, you know, it was a constant financial struggle, you know, beyond all the support, financial support that he did have, which, you know, I thought, uh, like you had mentioned, the dollar amounts uh, sounded fairly modern in the scheme of things. I think, you know, with, with um, uh, what was the, was it JP Morgan, was that, or? Right. No, Morgan gave yeah, him 75,000 yeah. for five years. That's huge money in a way, you know, so it's not, uh, you know, but it still wasn't enough, you know, because he had cast and crew uh, to, to uh, deal with. But I think you're right, though, the access that he had and the trust that uh, he was able to, uh, you know, get from these people was pretty amazing early on. When you got, you see, you know, hundreds, thousands of photographs of Native Americans, and they don't all have a soulfulness. There's a, mm -hmm. you know, we all have character armor. We all set up barriers, uh, particularly, I think, when we're being photographed. Mm -hmm. And somehow there's a magic, I, you know, it can only be explained in, in magical terms. But Curtis had a way of getting beyond that set of barriers. And I think that's why he continues to be so mm -hmm. justly admired in our time uh, but well, i'll show you yeah. go ahead i was going to say and i think that soulfulness you know part of it comes probably from two things you know it, that moment had to be calm right uh you know those exposures were longer you know people had to take uh the tempo down just a little bit to make things happen 
And on top of that, you know, it, it's his process, you know, that process that, that uh, how he made these things, how he printed these things, processed these things, uh, you know, uh, the softness to them, you know, all that, all that probably, you know, has something to do with, you know, what we saw when we looked at those photographs. I agree, of course. Um, and and just, just to follow up on what you said, he spent 30 years at it. There was never enough money. There was never enough time. There was never enough support. Um, and he, he was so passionate about this that he gave everything to it. So his wife mm-hmm. eventually divorced him mm-hmm. in a nasty front page divorce in Seattle. Um, she got the bulk of his um, wealth, uh, including the intellectual property from the studio. Uh, the, his children were not estranged, but he, he did not see them for extended periods of time. He was penniless. In fact, he came back from his 1927 a trip to the Arctic, and when he arrived in Seattle, he was he was arrested on the dock for debt uh, oh, and uh, an unpaid alimony. And so, he, by the time he died in 1952 in Hollywood, uh, where he became a kind of a still photographer on studio sets, um, he was penniless and essentially forgotten. The New York Times had a 72 word obituary which barely mentioned the great project. So, if, if ever a person gave himself wholly to the to something to some mm-hmm. enterprise it was it was curtis in this case here's called oasis um in the badlands which is just a lovely photograph um, this is um, a medicine calling image this is a, fish, a wishram uh, fishing uh, on the lower columbia this is an ericara bear ceremony these two shaman dressed as grizzly bears you see the, uh, the the lucky few who are able to witness this in the background. Um, just a lovely Roman style, mm-hmm. um, almost bas-relief portrait here. This is, um, I'll close with this, but here's a, this is a child. This is, this is Pegan. So this would be Blackfeet up in Northwestern Montana. This little girl has a little girl's play teepee, just the way little girls have playhouses. Uh, this was her play teepee and Curtis was able to get that image. So here he is. Um, in different phases of his life, uh, I just want to suggest a couple of things here. First, here, here's the here here is the the criticism that he takes in our own time, and I know you will feel some of that yourself, Tom, and and people mm-hmm. in the audience will too. Number one, Curtis locked Native Americans into a romantic past. He, he deliberately did not photograph them as they were. Um, he set up special backdrops and um, and urged them to wear um, regalia, clothing that was not um, European derived, was not white man's clothing. In a few cases where the, where it was inescapable to have some object that was an industrial white person's object, he tried to, um, I'll say, Photoshop it out in, in the darkroom. Um, he, he was not looking at Native Americans as they actually were in 19... 19- 10 say, but as he thought they had been before the great assimilation and conquest. Um, number two, he, he used money to persuade natives to cooperate. He paid fees and sometimes very large fees. Now in his defense, he often spent two, three months with the tribe before he took a single photograph doing menial work, just being there, earning trust, hauling water, uh, chopping firewood, doing whatever they asked him to do. And he said that kind of patience is what led to the breakthroughs. But he wasn't afraid, as most people in his time weren't either, to use money when it was useful. He sometimes manipulated his hosts. He would say uh, to you, Tom, if you don't let me photograph you, I'm going to photograph Paul, and Paul will be famous in history, and you will be utterly Mm -hmm. forgotten. Mm -hmm. Or he would say, hey, tell me your origin story. And you would say, I'm sorry, I can't tell you that. And he'd say, well, I know your origin story. It's when the moon uh, emerged from the, um, the sun. And then you'd say, no, no, that's not it at all. You're getting it all wrong. And then you would tell the actual story. So there are a whole series of techniques of persuasion that he used that make us cringe a little in the 21st century. More, more importantly, there were times when he transgressed into the world of the sacred. And that's a very big deal. Um, First of all, because Native peoples feel strongly about this, as you might expect, but also because, and I know this sounds a little bit mystical, but if you transgress into that world, you can cut the the spiritual lifeline. You can actually make that 
ceremony or that object become inert and no longer speak if you if you approach it without proper prayer, fasting, permission, etc. And then more generally, people say he had no right to appropriate Native American culture. And let me just very quickly define cultural appropriation. I'm sure everyone is aware of it, but cultural appropriation is taking something from another people without permission, without compensation, um, uh, presuming that you have the right to take an icon, an image, uh, a photograph, a, a, a story, a tradition, uh, and to and to bring it into your own cultural purposes, but without um, going through the the very difficult work of earning trust and uh, goodwill. Um, and then at, at a few points, he dressed natives in inauthentic dress and ornament. He had a small kit, and if he would say, "Dress as you please." but make sure that it's sort of pre-white conquest. And then if the individual said, well, I just, I just don't really know what to do, then he might say, well, here's a feather or here's a robe. And on several occasions, he had artifacts um, manufactured either on site or off site mm. for natives to hold. So that's, that's the list of, of the downside of Curtis. Mm. I'll just stop there for you to comment, Tom. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, just point by point in a way he, uh, uh, locked uh, Native Americans into a romanticized past. You know, it's kind of interesting that we probably, I know that the way we've looked at photographs and the way we kind of interpret photographs and uh, decode them and everything, it's, it's, possible, it's more than likely that certainly uh, that that point passed uh, uh, most people. They, they, they didn't see that. You know, they probably uh, took it to, to be fairly authentic in the scheme of things. And I, and I think also, um, you know, um, I think when photography started venturing out to these other, you know, places in the world, we generally, in general, we photographed that part of the world the way we imagined it to be, you know, no matter what it was, you know, it's not just the American Indians. you know, we showed up at the pyramids and we had this impression that the pyramids and, and all activity around the pyramids should be doing this and, and, all photographers made that happen. And so, so, you know, uh, and people believe that for a long time, I think it was only with the, you know, advent of, of real serious criticism and looking at photographs and trying to figure out what they're all about that, that, you know, we started to have a, a different view of this. And, um, you know, I think, uh, Again, to his credit, um, you know, I'd said earlier that he, he sh showed a lot of people a great deal of attention. Uh, other uh, people have, have done this as well. I know Richard Avendon, you know, when he went out to the American West to photograph, you know, he was criticized for exactly the same thing, uh, exploiting, you know, in the way that he chose his um, – uh, subjects and everything, exploiting, uh, you know, them. Uh, and his response to that was uh, – Almost. Uh, well, his response was, well, th this is my truth. You know, this is my truth. And uh, and just like John Wayne is, is Hollywood's truth, you know. And so the idea that there can be then now all of a sudden more than one one truth, you know, prescribed to a photograph, um, uh, you know, became certainly a popular way to think about photographs. Um you know, I think that, uh, you know, I think that it's been said that, you know, photographs, you know, are both uh, truthful, you know, uh, are, are both uh, are, are both true and false at the same time, you know, and I think that, we, you know, we, we see that in some of his work and probably most of his work, all of his work. Yeah, but, so I'll go on a little bit just to show you a couple of things. Here are some of his slides. It wasn't just photographs, 40,000 glass plate photographs. He had some of them converted into uh, these large uh, transparencies, some of which were hand colored, as you can see. And he gave these in lectures around the country to help raise money for the project. Um, and these lantern slides, I'll show you a few if we have time, but um, he had them colorized and it was like Technicolor then. It seems mm -hmm. a little bit um, cheesy in our time um, and inauthentic, but it really worked as a way to get the word out about what he was doing. And he took down sounds, eight to 10,000 Edison cylinder wow. discs of Native American music. And as you can see on the left, he used um, Western uh, classical musical notation to try to um, uh, to render some of that song in, in the 20 volumes of the North American Indian and motion pictures. Not only did he take a motion picture camera almost from the beginning and imagine how complex that was in mm -hmm. 1910, 
but he made what's regarded as the first full-length documentary film uh, called In the Land of the Headhunters uh, in 1914, again, to try to raise money for the project. These are gold tones. I just want to show you this. So you said earlier, it's not just the photograph, it's the processing, the printing techniques. And so he had many different printing techniques, some of which he pioneered. And this is called gold tone. Um, and it actually had a banana wash, but it, 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 when it was first invented, there was a bit of gold in it. You can see here this rush gatherer. But if you look at it from below, you see how it, 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 it just pops. And if you're, in, if you're in a Curtis exhibit, I'm sorry, the lights from the, the, the museum where I was have kind of damaged this a little bit. If you see um, that, which is a very nice photograph, and then this kind of 3D effect, his gold tones are, are justly famous. So, I mean, the point that we're making is that every photograph was composed. And that's so hard for someone in the 21st century to remember. Every photograph had to be set up and the person being photographed had to hold the pose for eight, sometimes 12 seconds. Um, the, the, it wasn't the, this is not photojournalism and this is not a snapshot. The, these are these are very delicately and painstakingly composed photographs. So here, for example, is a Klamath man at Crater Lake. Uh, this one bothers me a little. I mean, uh, some of his photographs seem more problematic to me than others, but I, I feel certain that this man did not wear these clothes on a Tuesday morning. Right. So right. Curtis said, you know, well, I want you to sit in kind of a melancholy way looking out at the Crater Lake. And then he winds up in a, in a war bonnet. And so that feels a little bit Hollywood to me. I don't think it's one of his best images here, by the way, is another version, the gold tone of an, of a, of, of the same man. You see how, how vibrant the gold tones are. But let's look at this for a minute, Tom, this is uh, uh, black Eagle on the left. And now this is the original. He cropped it of course, but this is how it actually happened. So black Eagle came in wearing a robe. Well, they spent some time folding the robe into just the right pattern, uh, both to satisfy Black Eagle and to satisfy Curtis. He had a backdrop here, and then there are some uh, miscellaneous items on the side. And so then when he finally finishes this photograph in a tent with a backdrop, he then goes away and crops it and does a variety of darkroom techniques to bring it out into one of his greatest single portraits, but mm -hmm. I like when we can lift the curtain a little bit mm -hmm. and see behind it. Here's Roosevelt for his book, Hunting Trips in the Ranchland. He came out to guy. Dakota when he was a kid and he, you know, he, he, he threw himself into cowboy life. He went back this, I love this photograph because it was taken in a New York studio mm -hmm. and that's a backdrop. And I, as a person from the Great Plains, I can tell you, we don't have trees. Mm -hmm. We don't have ferns. This is just a, a photographer's backdrop. And imagine Roosevelt walking into this studio wearing this. He's a New York aristocrat wearing this buckskin shirt and, and saying, this is how I want to be known into the literary world. The, the artificiality of that at about the same time is worth remembering. And that remember, I showed that picture of the young Pegan girl with her toy teepee. This is Curtis's working print. So he printed them. Um, glued them to pieces of cardboard, and then he wrote his his notes yes. here for the yeah. publication, and and that's really helpful to yeah. sort of again slightly lift the curtain. Yeah, well, I like to see that. It's like seeing the artist hand, you know, in a painting uh, on the borders, the little trial marks and so forth. And you know, I, I, I curse you know, had not a problem with making photographs as opposed to taking photographs, you know? Right. I mean, he not at all. And I think that, you know, uh, when I'm kind of looking at a photograph for some understanding of how a photograph works, you know, the first thing I wanted to know is what else was going on at the time, right? And so the pictorialist, you know, were, were doing their thing at the time. And, and he would have seen all that stuff. He's and part so, of that movement. Uh, yeah, yeah. So he would have had no problem with you know taking a base image like like this that that you're showing right now and do, and trying to figure out now how, what can I make out of this? See what what I love about this Tom is that when you when you see the one on the left you think mm -hmm. okay I get it I get it mm -hmm. um, and it's a it's a good photograph mm -hmm. it's not a great photograph but look what he did with it so mm -hmm. he goes back mm -hmm. to Seattle and he played with it and he turned it into this magnificent pictorialist portrait. Mm -hmm. um, 
what happened after the photograph was taken was at least as important as the photograph mm -hmm. itself. And he worked mm -hmm. extremely hard to get the mood that he wanted, to get the shadowing effects that he wanted. Look at, for example, uh, the, the overexposure on his chest and how he fixed that mm -hmm. in the dark room and the way that the, the robe becomes much more um, uh, embedded into the backdrop here, which brings out uh, that one moccasin in a beautiful mm -hmm. way. I mean, this is a master um, yeah. processor. I mean, it's hard to imagine, you know, if you were to just see if you can figure out the, 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 the uh, financial investment, the time investment, you know, divided by a single photograph, you know, in that, you know, he was taking, you know, photographs and not many photographs, but, you know, single photographs at a time and spending a lot of time on them. It's kind of amazing to me. And, uh, you know, one thing kind of related to what we were talking about before, I know that Terry Barrett um, has this really n nice, nice uh, uh, text on uh, criticizing photographs. He talks about photographs uh, just in terms of, you know, the information, uh, where they come from and, and, and how they're made. And, you know, he says that um, um, pho photographs and photographers you know, the generalities are photographs and photographers all alter what they picture. Um, that photography is a subtractive medium. Uh, the subject matter is always cut from a larger context. You know, so we only just always see a piece piece of it. And that and, and my favorite is that meanings of images are not always limited to what their makers meant them to mean. In other words, the maker doesn't own the meaning of the image. So that when we look at these things years later, you know, we're interpreting them based on, you know, our cultural experience uh, now. And uh, hence, you know, some of the, the bad rap that he's gotten over time is probably more currently cultural than, than in, in, in the time period. Absolutely. No, ex ex excellent, uh, excellent points. So I just want to show you this. This is a picture by Eric Miola from a really beautiful book of Great Plains photographs. Uh, look at how this was composed, Tom. Mm -hmm. you know, so I, I live on the Great Plains. I love to take storm mm -hmm. photographs. It's a book of storm photographs. You don't just go out on a Thursday morning and get this photograph. Mm -hmm. He had identified this tree. He had to wait for the storm to develop. Maybe it didn't develop and, it, and he lost that day. Mm -hmm. You can see how he wanted it to uh, embrace the top of the tree, but not get in the way of this mm -hmm. glorious old mm -hmm. cottonwood. This mm -hmm. is a really difficult photograph to take. And it probably took him. You, it, he didn't just drive by and pull the window down mm -hmm. on his car. Mm -hmm. That's that's composed. So so great photographers still compose. Um, he, here's one I took in Yellowstone two weeks ago. That one was outside the window of uh -huh. my car. It's uh -huh. a it's a nice photograph, but it's not a great photograph. It's just a nice snapshot that I happen to take. And you could might maybe mess with this in the mm -hmm. in Photoshop and make it something better. But you see the difference. Mm -hmm. This is the work of a person who knew what he wanted and worked hard to get it and could not be guaranteed that he would. This is something I took because we stopped the car um, and it was snowing. And I thought, hey, I'll take a picture there. And here again, it's just so mm -hmm. fine. And here's what photography is for most people today. You know, that you hold up your, your camera at the concert. You don't even, you don't even look through a viewfinder. Right. You assume you're going to capture it in some sense. And so that's why I say that the difference between photography as Curtis practiced it and photography as it's done, say, on my smartphone is not just in degree, it's really in kind. It's a whole different enterprise, although both share the capture of light. Well, well you figure, too, he, he, he was, you know, an ultimate technician. He had to be a technician. He was a chemist. You know, and, 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 and the, you know, and those days to, to get this stuff. But, um, you know, everything he brought to the photograph after couldn't have happened without you know, uh, the composition at the scene and, and a decent exposure and all these other things, you know, he wouldn't be able to do any of uh, what he had done, you know, uh, post capture to, to bring out, you know, the, the, the image and neither could that um, photograph of that planes with the tree, you know, that, that, yeah. that, that was a nice composition. That was a really nice exposure. My guess is and everything else, he just sort of, you know, brought to it some seamless organic, you know, manipulation that kind of, rendered his vision just a little bit clearer. And I think, you know, Curtis did the same thing. If you and I wind up here in, in um, Black Eagle's tent, um, each of us has a, a state-of-the-art digital camera, I might take 75, I might right. take 200 images in a minute. Um, and then we go back and see what we've got. Curtis mm -hmm. had one chance at this because mm -hmm. you can't develop this on the same day. 
Mm -hmm. He's taking this picture. He may take five photographs in a day. On a great day, he might take 10. But if he misses this, if he goes, I'll show you one that, that near, was a near miss. Let me go forward to find that. So just this, here's a picture of President Obama on the Standing Rock Indian Reservation in North Dakota at the end of his um, second term. It's a great picture, but it's not a great photograph. Mm. You know, the, the composition leads a lot to be desired, but it's a great picture, but it's photojournalism. That's what you do when you can't compose it. You're just on the fly, mm -hmm. taking the best picture you can under mm -hmm. the circumstances. But again, here's Chairman Archambault of the Standing Rock Lakota. I'm guessing he doesn't dress in his headdress mm -hmm. on any given day either. So it's complex. This is the famous photograph of Canyon de Chez. Imagine how many takes this took. Not necessarily to, to, to expose the plate, but he has to get this right. And these people are 100 yards away from him. So he's shouting at them. Mm -hmm. Uh, the three in front, uh, you're too close together. The three in back, catch up, turn around. Let's go back and do it again. Every, my point is every Curtis photograph is composed. And this is sort of how you see it. Here he is in Canyon de Chez with native people setting up a photograph and they're thinking about it. They're, it's like a director at, on a movie set. How, how are we going to film this? And you almost get the sense of the old Hollywood um, image of the, of the, the heroic director with the cone. Here's a picture that, of the kind that I told you about, Tom. Here is mm -hmm. a pig in tent, and he found a clock in it when he got back to the studio. Mm -hmm. So it's too late. So what did he do? Mm -hmm. um, he photoshopped it out using the techniques of the time, put a basket mm -hmm. in instead. So th this causes some people to criticize him because they say, hey, these, these men had a clock. What's so mm -hmm. wrong with that? But he said, no, that, that spoils the image. Here's a picture I took it's a bad picture because of the lighting of a painting in the museum of the west in scottsdale last week and you see we're in a postmodern time now so here we have this native person dressed up it's an american flag and there's a coca-cola can so today we are not we do not want most people don't want to lock indigenous and other peoples into a heroic past they want to look in a with multiple intellectual lenses and eyes at the same thing right Mm -hmm. You got. I think you have a couple of images too. Do you want to show them now? Yeah. Um, you know, let me let me share this one. This is kind of interesting, and this is. Uh, I'll pull back for the moment. Okay, I want to bring this up. Okay, and a couple of these. Now, I just show these real real quick too. I want to bring them up. You know, uh, for instance, I mentioned earlier, uh, Avondon went to the west. You know, here is a cast and crew of characters that he selected. Right. And all of them, you know, are, are, are pretty interesting looking. And, you know, I guess they, they again, they gave him, you know, a hard time for picking uh, probably, uh, you know, some of the more outrageous, you know, subjects, perhaps. And, um, you know, the other uh, frame I wanted to show you was this picture story, how photographing the Omo Valley people changed their lives. Uh, it's an article that came out in about uh, 2015 which um, speaks to just exactly, you know, what you were talking about uh, in that, um, uh, you know, this, this uh, Omo Valley, uh, you know, it talks about incredibly photogenic, uh, but tourism is turning their lives into daily fancy dress parade in that, uh, you know, when they show up, these people don't dress like this at all uh, during the day, right? People show up and, and immediately there's, they scurry into their tents and they, you know, apply paint and everybody gets into character, everybody gets into place and, and photographs are taken. And this, this is, you know, so this still goes on pretty much today, right? Um, I think that, uh, and probably, you know, so some, you know, again, real manipulation and real theater here. Um, and then, uh, you know, probably one of my favorites really is, um, oh, I was looking earlier at the Valley Fine Art where you can get an Edward, you know, S. Curtis uh, print for about $3,500, right? <laughs> so there, there's a pricey tag to these things uh, currently. But, um, you know, one of, one of my favorite is currently uh, Jimmy Nelson, uh, this photographer. And let me share this with you. Uh, you know, he has done a lot of work and uh, the, the press he, he's received is uh, largely, hey, uh, haven't you been paying attention to Edward S. Curtis? 
<laughs> then you see the, the kind of the bad rap that he got. So, you know, th this is his uh, website and it could be glitzier in that, you know, we're talking exhibition fine arts, you know, books and stories and lectures. And, you know, so he's built this whole entire, you know, um, uh, you know, thing around, you know, people and places and before they pass, you know, he has this long list of, of people on here, you know, or tribes and so forth before they pass and, and then uh, homage to humanity. But then again, the list before they pass, um, I think uh, one, uh, you know, when, when we get in here and look at these, um, they're gorgeous, right? They're gorgeous photographs. Um, wow. You know, and but, um, you know, but there's somewhere in between, um, you know, um, truth and, you know, and not. And and I think that that's an, that's the other thing is, it's probably an OK place to be. It's, it's you know, it's really not that bad. Um, the fact that, you know, any one set of photographs could have multiple interpretations or multiple different ways to look at them, I think, is. Is, is helpful. And so, um, you know, I've read some really nice stories on this. I think, um, you know, one of the things I remember in terms of Curtis was, you know, current Native Americans, there are a lot of current Native Americans that really like those photographs because, you know, they thought that they showed them to be really no noble portraits, you know? So. Um, Agreed. Yeah. Let me show you a photograph graph it um here if i can get oh wait okay you're you're okay i'm gonna try I'm here, yeah. here we go. all right so let me find i want to show you this one that i'm kind of fascinated by uh, so the myth of the vanishing Indians said before you know before they're gone so this was a big part of this era almost every white person and including really smart thoughtful often sensitive white people felt that indians were going native americans were going right. to disappear one way or the other so either they were going to disappear culturally in order to survive biologically or they were simply going to go extinct that the, the maybe native cultures were not compatible with railroads and uh, Conestoga wagons and, and uh, mm -hmm. Christian churches and so on. So this is a huge part of this. And so here's of course, one of the most famous icons in America. This is James Earl Frazier's uh, end of the trail. And here it was done in, in 1896. And here you see, uh, mm -hmm. This uh, the, the horse is tired. The lance is no longer in a fighting mm -hmm. position. The native person is slumped over his saddle. This is so widely reproduced. You can see it on almost any day in any zip code in America. Mm -hmm. There is a, a more stylized version of it. Um, you see it everywhere. And so I want to show you this one. This is this is a, a photograph that he took early in his work. It became his um, signature photograph for the project. Because Curtis himself believed in the myth of the vanishing Indian. Now we know that didn't happen. They're very much still here. Their cultures are in many regards in recovery. There are language restoration programs all over the nation. Their craft work has made a huge comeback. Um, new laws and new um, interpretations of treaties are coming down more often in their favor than not. So th they did not disappear. That's number one. And th although they don't dress up, in quite the same way as, as they are in Curtis photographs, they're very much still with us. So he took this picture in the field. He gets back to Seattle and it was underexposed mm -hmm. and he didn't know what to do with it. And so he, and he had a brilliant darkroom chemist named Adolf Muir, and they stayed up a whole night playing with this in different forms, trying to print it in different ways, try to bring it out. And finally they got this. And he said, bingo, that's what I want. And so mm -hmm. it's not the photograph he thought he was taking, mm -hmm. but it turned out to be better because this then is that very image of the end of the race, these in single file with the exception of this horseman on the left, they're leaving into this dark future um, that, you know, the, the one person is turning back like Lot's wife almost as Native Americans um, are, um, disappear from the theater, from the stage of American life. And so here's an example of how a great chemist and darkroom master can make something out of a, what was essentially a failed image. Well, and, you know, to me, the best thing is to just formally speaking, um, 
you know, what a great image. I, I, th- I thought this image, may- maybe I'm wrong, but I thought it uh, was a, a prominent image in, in that collection, you know, close yeah, to the bird. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, here we see uh, the image itself is this fading dream. You know, it's 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 soft. It's it's fading as we're looking at it right right on the page. And so so stylistically, how appropriate. It's it's as if it's dissolving. It's pixelating yeah, out. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. And, and look at the shadows of the horseman. I mean, this is an incredible photograph. Yeah. And um, he didn't have to do any of this by Photoshop. He did, he didn't mm-hmm. manipulate the chemistry, mm-hmm. but. But it, there's there aren't it's not as if you can mix and match photographs mm-hmm. as you can today. This is the image, and it it became the signature piece, and and for white people, um, who were going to buy these images or support his work, this is how they this is what they thought mm-hmm. a Native American was a person who was noble, but leaving. Mm-hmm. That there was a there was a there was a dissolution of Indianness in American life, and here's a the the famous. Um, um, mural from the same time. This is Lady Columbia with a, a textbook in her hand. I don't know why she's so lightly clothed. She's stringing telegraph wires, and mm-hmm. look who's. And, and so pioneers are coming, trains are coming. There's ships at port. There are bridges. There's plowing. There's homesteading. But look who's leaving the scene. Yeah, right, right. The buffalo, the Native Americans, and right. the wolves and coyotes are leaving the scene because they're incompatible with civilization. So mm-hmm. Curtis was caught up in that, and that that as you said. The, the photographer is in the picture. He may not, or she may not be imaged in the picture, but mm-hmm. C- Curtis took pictures that were Curtis pictures. You would take pictures that are Tom pictures. Mm-hmm. I would take pictures that are Clay pictures. Your ideology, your cultural attitudes, your worldview, mm-hmm. inevitably uh, color what you've produced. Well, you know, and I, and I think that the kind of interesting thing too, his, uh, you know, his photographs, you know, check a lot of boxes, you know, I mean, they, they, his photographs, they, they're, they're certainly descriptive, you know, but they do attempt to explain something. They, they attempt to, you know, um, in some cases, you know, uh, evaluate them ethically came much later, mm-hmm. you know, that we kind of uh, did that to these photographs, but it definitely they're, they're aesthetic. And, um, you know, I think that based on the time period that he did, there certainly are interpretive. So, they, I mean, they check a lot of boxes. And I, what I think is kind of cool is, again, you know, there was probably less less pressure on him than uh, sure. to, to struggle with some of uh, these inconsistencies and these cultural inconsistencies and so forth. But they did lay the groundwork for, you know, uh, as we looked at these photographs later, um, again, um, you know, thinking back, okay, where did the photograph come from? What was curl, uh, culturally relevant at the time? And, and, and using that to judge their success then, and then um, kind of focusing on the difference uh, in, in cultural events now to use that photograph to prompt discussion about these issues now. You know, so this comes up and, and, and we're talking about this uh, now, how this wasn't right or this was appropriation or this and that. And uh, that probably never would have happened as much earlier, except with some, you know, some, some critics, perhaps. It didn't happen at all, really. I mean, people were just thinking, thank goodness you've gotten it before it's too right, late. Right, right. Widespread notion. And, and, and just to say a little bit more about that, Tom, a number of natives in our time are, are reconnecting with their own culture through photographs mm-hmm. of Curtis. Mm-hmm. And there's a couple that are good friends of mine in um, Colorado who, are, by the way, he's the great grandson of Curtis. And they're going to places where Curtis worked and taking photographs of descendants of images from Curtis. And so it, it's not as if there is a Native American hostility to this, not at all. Um, but there is there's a great deal of, of more awareness of the metadata, the story behind the story today than there would have been at his time. Mm-hmm. I'll leave these. I just want to show you. These are the pictures he took of Roosevelt's children. Oh, man, gorgeous. Look at that magnificent portrait of that's uh, Quentin. Mm-hmm. And here's Quentin and Archie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and here's my friend Gerard Baker of Mile City, Montana. He's Hidatsa. Mm-hmm. And he's been so helpful to me, Tom, because I show him these images and then he comments. And yeah. I ask him these hard questions. And uh-huh. he grounds me and he says, you know, we talked about this. And he said, well, of course he manipulated and of course he dressed people up and of course he romanticized us and he said and thank goodness he did what he did because imagine if we did not have the curtis uh, works you know that we're we've 
of course it's problematic, but every cultural artifact yeah. is problematic. Right. Here's, here's the map of his travels. I just want to show you this. I want to make sure we don't not look at this, the transgression of the sacred. So he's with the White Mountain Apache on the New Mexico, um, Arizona border. He, he wants to, he, he was told by the Smithsonian that the Apache have no religious life. They have no sacred mm -hmm. life. He said, that can't be true. That's just, mm -hmm. that's just not true. Yeah. So he went down and he spent months, you know, just doing menial tasks, winning the uh, trust of people. But he finally couldn't, he couldn't get anybody to talk to him about the sacred. So he then crept up on a, um, a man, <coughs> a shaman by the name of Goshone, while he was praying every morning besides a river. And eventually Goshone caught him and was, of course, angry, felt mm -hmm. terribly violated. <coughs> but this led to conversations. And eventually Goshone, with extraordinarily re reluctant hesitation, showed Curtis this sacred buckskin. And this is wow. there's a whole <coughs> complex iconography mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. that he explained. And some of it wound up in the text part of the North American Indian. So here's Goshone. <coughs> Excuse me. Goshone came to him a few days later after showing him the sacred buckskin and telling him the story and said, I shouldn't have done it. I got to take it back. And Curtis said, you can't take it back. And Goshone said, this is terrible. I have violated the trust of my tribe. He said, my life will now be um, very short. And Curtis laughed this off, he went back to Seattle. A few months later, he got word that Goshone was dead. No. So here's yeah. an image. This is, this is an image, a very rare oh. one from the Rainier yeah. Club in Seattle of Goshone. But Curtis was a little ruthless about this. And here's yeah, he should have given it back. <laughs> yeah, here's, and here's his picture, not of Goshone, but of another person with the sacred mm. buckskin. Magnificent photograph. And look oh how my he gosh. manipulated yeah. the image in studio. Uh, just the composition of this is incredible. So... So this then, this these are the sacred turtles of the Mandan up here in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. and I, I only show this to illustrate this. I'm doing an exhibit on Curtis and Roosevelt for the TR Center at Dickinson, North Dakota, and we're not going to show these images. We're going to talk about them, but not show them. So he wanted, this is the most sacred religious tradition of the Mandan. Mm -hmm. And there is a keeper. There's a person who is who becomes the keeper of the sacred turtles. These are the sacred turtles. And it's his job to, um, to take care of them. And you have to bring them out once a year to expose them to the sun and bring them to the river. And there's a whole set of things mm -hmm. that have to happen. And Curtis so wanted to get this picture. So he worked and worked and worked at it. He had a, uh, a, a tribal liaison named Alexander Upshaw, who had been educated at the Carlisle Indian school. And finally, after months of wearing down, the man who controlled this, he offered him $500, a fortune, wow. to let him take these pictures. And so the man with great hesitation did. So here's the first one. This is in a, a, a log cabin um, in the center of North Dakota in 1908. And he gets this picture. And then he, he thought, well, so far, so good. He said, I, they don't look like turtles to me. Can mm -hmm. Would you remove the feathers? And if you can imagine it, Tom, the man did. And here they are. Mm -hmm. here are the yeah. sacred turtles and even Curtis when he wrote about this uh, in the appropriate volume I think it's volume 5 of the North American Indian said that I felt uneasy about this I, I know that I was doing something wrong here mm -hmm. I know why I did it mm -hmm. I'm sure that posterity will be glad that I did but I feel that this is you know, that I've done something that that violates mm -hmm. the, the the shaman and violates the tradition and violates the sacred mm -hmm. turtles, and so you know he he's not unaware of these things. There's a certain mm -hmm. sensitivity about it, and yet he was bound and determined to get the image. And so here we have these two. I asked my friend Gerard Baker about this, and he said the turtle still exists. One of them still exists. There still is a keeper of it. Mm -hmm. um, he knows who it is. Uh, that this is very important to the man then. And I said, do you wish he hadn't done this? And he said, well, yes and no. Mm -hmm. I think that's your answer. Yes and no. Mm -hmm. 
So let me just quickly toggle through these and then I'll pull out. These are the colorized slides and you see how cheesy they look to us, but these are the hand colored slides that he used yeah. in his national lectures. And to us, this looks like silly, but imagine in, in 1915, it's like, wow, it's color. Uh, you, you would have heard a gas in the audience. You know? Bring it. Here's a yeah. Mandan Earth Lodge with a bull boat. Here's that same mm -hmm. um, eagle catcher. Look how beautiful the colorization of that slide mm -hmm. was. Um, this one is a little garish, but mm -hmm. I'm sure the crowd just loved it. Mm -hmm. Just just loved it. So I'll pull out at that point so we can just take some questions. I know that my friend Shane Belkovich of here in North Dakota is a very distinguished wet plate um, glass plate photographer. And he is doing something quite similar to Curtis. He's taking pictures of Native Americans, but he's not going out and seeking them. They come to him and ask him to take their photograph. And he plays no role in how they dress or how they wish to be presented. But he's trying to bring dignity and a sense of agency and a sense of um, confidence to the native peoples of the plains and beyond so that they can be photographed as they see themselves or as they want to, their, their, their culture to be remembered. And, and he made the point in the chat room that every day now we take more photographs in the world than existed until the year 2000. Mm -hmm. So every picture from 1830 until the year 2000 were put in one part of a balance and then the number of pictures taken per day now by mm -hmm. cell phones and mm -hmm. smartphones. So it's just an explosion of a, of a sort that it caught, it has its own set of problems. For example, how are you going to store mm -hmm. trillions of photographs of our time? Let's see what else is in the chat room here. The way he composes photographs is a lot like the Instagram influencers today selling the idealistic storyline. What do you say to that? Well, you know, um, again, I, you know, he, he certainly might have been doing that, but that was the probably one of the only storylines that existed, you know, and and, uh, you know, I, I do think that, um, you know, as I look at these photographs and I think I may have mentioned this before, as I, if I as I have learned to look at photographs, you know, I'm reluctant to, to draw a line in the sand. And to and to to say whether or not you know this is good, this is bad. Um, I like this. I don't like this. I think that for me over the over the years, and it's taken you know, I hate to say this, it's taken decades. You know, I kind of remember when I was young and just uh, in college, uh, you know, as a freshman, just you know, looking at this stuff. Um, I could, I was probably easily fooled and influenced, and had no real opinion on that, on it. But I think that over the years, you know. Um, I've come to understand, you know, how, how we look at photographs. And uh, I think it's just, uh, you know, it's a lot more uh, complex. And, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's what I like about looking at photographs. You know, I like the, the, the conversations uh, that we have about them and uh, the different things they can be to different people. And so I'm really reluctant to, again, draw the line in the sand uh, and, uh, you know, make it make a judgment about photographs. I'm much more interested in learning something and and, um, you know, having I, I guess, you know, my opinions change about photographs in a process over the years. And I find that to be really, really refreshing, especially every time something happens or I see something and learn something that dramatically changes my opinion about a photographic style. It's very liberating. So. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, I, I come at it as a humanities scholar. And my view is that, first of all, I want to know the backstory. Right. You know, there's a backstory to every single photograph um, because these there was a, a slowing of the pace, a deliberation that we no longer have to use. There was a, a long setup time. There's the posing time. There's the how would you like to be dressed? It's more like studio photography, but even mm -hmm. studio photography today is at an enormously faster pace than what we're seeing in Curtis. So that's one thing. What's the backstory here? The second thing is, if you lift the curtain and, and try to think about what's going on in American life, in attitudes towards Native peoples, in emerging technologies around photography and public presentation, um, et cetera, that the, con the contextualization, that if you complicate these stories, they become much, much more interesting. And for me, that picture of Black Eagle in, in the final product and then Black Eagle posing in the tent says it all. I mean, it just says, 
when I first looked at these photographs, I was like you, naive. I looked at them and thought, wow, what a great photograph. And I never thought about it. I, I wonder under what conditions this photograph was taken. I wonder what sort of cameras were being used. I wonder what sort of darkroom manipulations, if any, were being uh, used, what different types of chemistry and so on. Well, then when you start to really think about it, you realize, oh, this is a very complex mm -hmm. negotiation. It's a complex technological event. It's a complex event in travel. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it has something to do with Curtis's own attitudes and passions. Mm -hmm. Also, public expectations. Uh, and so the more you complicate these and begin to look at a photograph as something more than a snapshot, mm -hmm. the more interesting it gets, right? Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's hard, to, hard to come back from um, a, a, a really strong, strong opinion about something. So I, I like to keep it a little looser. Um, you know, I know that when I looked at this uh, Jimmy Nelson stuff, first time I saw it, I don't know, it might have been, I think, on a communication arts uh, photo annual. Um, and I thought, you know, these are pretty slick looking, had nothing to, I did not know anything about them. And I tell you what, I've changed my mind about that work. Practically almost every time I read something new changes kind of something about how I feel about that work. And, um, I, I you know, I think, I think it's exciting to do that. And, and I think the thing that you have to be careful of is again, you can't change your mind if it's set in stone, you know, so I'm kind of, uh, you know, when we're looking at photographs, I think we have to be pretty, you know, uh, open to different interpretations and, and, and have those conversations. I think they're all useful. You know, so I take pictures along the Lewis and Clark trail out in the American mm -hmm. West. And if you go to a, um, a sort of a famous place on the Lewis and Clark trail, you, if you, if you, set up the camera just right and, and, and make sure that you crop it perfectly. You can make it seem as if it's just plausibly 1804, uh -huh, right. but that's, you could also take a picture and see that there's a semi truck there and there's a grain elevator and there's right. a person peeing on the side of the road. Right, right. So which is the more authentic photograph? And I right. think you're saying that there is no answer to this question. Right. 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 Yeah. I, I like that. I think that, you know, uh, a really probably harsh view, or maybe maybe it's just a, maybe it's a cynical view, or maybe it's just you know where I begin a conversations with my students that that I, I would put out that photographs are incapable maybe of, of telling the truth. You know, on one way looking at it, you know, and but that's I suppose if we def if we decide that there has to be one truth, you know, then then they're probably incapable of it. So. Um, but but I like that they're a mixture, you know. I, I like that they're a mixture of uh, you know um, of you know what's there and what's not. You know, you think of his achievement. Um, so not all of the ten thousand cylinder discs still exist, but lots of them do. They're at mm -hmm. Indiana University, and I have access to some for this exhibit. Mm -hmm. uh, not all of the forty thousand photographs exist, but a, a few thousand continue to exist, and they haven't all been published. Uh, some mm -hmm. of them have never been published. Um, he was forgotten. So he worked, he got the grant from, um, from JP Morgan in 1905 for five years, $15,000 per annum. He was expected to, to pay all the costs to himself and to pay all the printing costs mm -hmm. and take on all those risks himself. In the end, the Morgans gave him more than $2 million and that wasn't enough to fund the project. He was penniless. He was um, double mortgaging everything. He was uh, borrowing from his friends and annoying them and never paying them back. And his wife um, really put it to him in the divorce. And, and I'm on her side. She was neglected for mm -hmm. 30 years because not only would he go out and do this, Tom, go out, say, in April and spend five months out in the field. Mm -hmm. but when he finally finished with one, two or three tribes, then he and his small team wouldn't go back to Seattle. They would get into a, a hut or a cabin somewhere and write up their ethnology because he knew mm -hmm. that if they went back to their homes, they just wouldn't write it. That you, he had to use almost a um, house arrest with himself and his team to do it. Mm -hmm. So now they've been gone for five months. They're in debt. They're in a hut for two and a half or three months to write this all up. And then when he went home for two days, he'd have to get on the train and go to New York to try to raise mm -hmm. money and to mm -hmm. sell more copies of the book give lectures. I mean, yeah. this is a man who gave his entire life to the success of this project. And now that I'm so deep in this, I want to ask, and I would, if I, knew, if I could, why'd you do it? Mm -hmm. well, you know, because there were three or four times, remember the pandemic of 1919, 
mm -hmm. uh, which was much more severe than ours. World War I, the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, um, the missionaries were doing everything in their power to, uh, to force natives not to show traditional clothing and traditional religious ceremonies. The Indian agents were working against him, often conspiring to get him thrown off of the reservations. He, he sacrificed everything on behalf of this project. I'm trying to think of, well, how often does that happen? Well, I think he had, you know, he had a this quintessential um, artist personality, uh, you know, in that, you know, he was ready to sacrifice and he had this drive and this vision and that couldn't, um, you know, he couldn't, couldn't be satisfied and uh, at all costs. And, you know, I, I think, you know, there are a lot of, that's kind of a, you know, the fact that, you know, he, he didn't have enough money. He, he, he died in poverty and the like, those are standard artistic personality characteristics. So, <laughs> so I guess the guy was a true artist in, in that regard. And, you know, it also made me think, um, you know, uh, the, the, back to the Jimmy Nelson, who's covered, you know, spent a lot of time with, with various tribes. And I, I read one response uh, to, you know, his work from um, a, 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 a uh, indigenous, uh, you know, person who said, Hey, you know, we're not dead yet. And he kind of went on this rant, you know, about, uh, you know, we're, we're not dead yet. And I think then um, there was a, re a reply from a critic who said, well, you know, okay, but step back a little bit and, and, and maybe give him some space because again, he's spending a lot of time and a lot of energy with a lot of people all over the globe. And is, is that a bad thing? in a way, you know? So uh, again, I think, you know, there, I, I like the fact that there are multiple views in the way we interpret people's work and why they do it. Yeah. My very good friend, Kathy Fuller of the Smithsonian sends a, a question to us. Uh, and hi, Kathy. Um, she says, how do you break through contemporary short attention spans to tell this kind of more nuanced and complicated story? How do we get people to slow down and to listen to more challenging backstories? And uh, we, it is true that of course the, the pace of life in our time is mm -hmm. just breathtakingly uh, short in attention span and the backstories, especially when you're dealing with something controversial. So just take the, the idea of say manipulating his subjects mm -hmm. or bribing them. You can, you can, you can make, you can draw a line in the sand quite easily and say, he should never have done that. I mean, that, that discredits his work. Or you can say, no, this was kind of standard activity in his time and payment was something that natives enjoyed and needed or many, many positions in between. But Kathy's view is, how do you keep people's attention long enough to tell stories that aren't automatically cast in simpleton terms? Right. Yeah, I mean, people want to know how they should feel. So, so tell me about this work and tell me how I should interpret it and tell me how I should feel. And then we're done with the conversation instead of trying to work at it and, and come to that conclusion themselves, maybe over, uh, over um, you know, several conversations, for instance, you know, I'd rather just kind of get it out of the way and uh, check that box. I think, I don't know. I think, I, th I think you talk about, uh, you go to, uh, you have, you have in-depth conversations about smaller blocks of material in a way. Uh, if I were teaching know. photography, which you, um, I don't, uh, and Paul wants us to pass this back to him, please, but, Okay. Uh, we're done here. But, but if I were teaching it, I would make everyone uh, take a 35 millimeter camera with Tri-X film and go out and take some pictures and have to develop them and have to dodge and burn in and crop and do um, um, all the things that have to be done just to slow it down and to remind them that if you're taking pictures of a wedding and you have 12 images on your roll, you better be really thoughtful about those 12 images. You can't take 1,200 Mm -hmm. And then uh, and see what happens with Photoshop. So I think slowing it down uh, in photography helps. But how you do that in an exhibit or do that in the kind of uh, conversation we're having is a much mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. complex business. But I think we have to do it. And I think we've done a little mm -hmm. uh, of that tonight. So, Tom, first of all, thank you so much. I've so enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, this has been I wanted nice. you to thank play you. the bongo, but, uh, but right. you didn't. Right. Uh, but, right. Paul, right. I, think it's, um, I think you want us to, to hand this back to you, my dear friend, Paul. Classico. Oh, thanks, guys. That was really good. You know, one thing that I was thinking about during this, looking at those images, is that there's you know, there's photographers that are known for their sweeping landscapes. You know, Ansel Adams, obviously, 
there's photographers like it was a contemporary of uh, Curtis's Alfred Stieglitz uh, mm-hmm. or Stieglitz. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce mm-hmm. it. Uh, that, 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 that that was so adept at, 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 at portraiture, both formal and 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 uh, uh, casual. Uh, but the but Curtis was able to not only capture the essence of these or what we think is the essence of these uh, human subjects, but also capture the the the, the the land which partially defined them. Uh, mm-hmm. and I, that's remarkable. Yeah, um, the, let me just close with, if I can get Tom, I mean, I'm sorry, Paul, go ahead and keep talking and take no, us no. out. Let me just want to go back to this one photograph just to illustrate what you're saying as we close. Um, he had a conversion experience in Montana. George Bird Grinnell invited him out to take pictures of the, of the last Sundance of the Blackfeet people, and he went and he, and he had seen Native Americans in the in Puget Sound, and they were largely living on the margins of, of Seattle society. Many of them were deeply impoverished, living in rags, mm-hmm. et cetera. And then he went out here into near Browning, Montana, and he saw this encampment of several hundred teepees and not a yeah. fence in sight and not a house in sight. And he said, mm-hmm. ah, you know, A, they're still here, and there's still mm-hmm. time to get this down, and B, they, you cannot separate them from the lands on which mm-hmm. they live. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Uh, thanks, guys. Mm-hmm. Let's do it again sometime. Sure, I'd like I that. Understand that uh, Murphy's Law caused my audio feed to be cut off at the beginning. Uh, so I'd like to make that up by recognizing tonight's presenter, Tom Sigmund. Uh, he's an amazing photographer who exhibits regionally and is professor and program head of photography studies here at Tidewater Community College. Thank you, Tom. All right. Sure enough. You're welcome. Thank uh, you. well, we're joining you from Tidewater Community College in Norfolk, Virginia. Tonight's program was a segment of our Arts and Humanities Pathways online series, My Thoughts, My Voice, My Arts. I'm Paul Lassico, and on behalf of our president, Dr. Marsha Constant, uh, vice president and chief academic officer, Dr. Michelle Woodhouse, pathways dean, Dr. Kerry Rodno, uh, and everyone here at TCC, thanks so much for coming. Uh, and thank you, Matt Freeman, our wizard behind the curtains, for taking care of all the tech stuff. Finally, Tidewater Community College occupies multiple campuses in southeastern Virginia on the unceded land of the Pamake. Nansaman, Chickahominy, and other tribes. Wow. This land has been a cultural and creative center for millennia. And we acknowledge and thank those that have come before us. And we honor the members and elders of those tribes on whose land we work and live. Finally, to our audience, thanks so much for coming. And to you, a very good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night.